Yeah, well, I'll start by sharing what I just saw out my window. I'm up on the fourth floor of an old mill, uh, linen mill building, and I saw a young boy, I'd say 12 or 13, running across the parking lot with his arms out to the side as if he were flying. And he's running at full speed with his arms out, and he got to a car, and he touched the car with one of his arms, and then spun around and did a 360 as his body rolled across the back of the car, and then he grabbed the doorknob on the other side of the car and opened it up. And then 10 seconds later, what I would imagine is his mother and father come walking to the car very slowly. And it was, it was perfect to see that moment happening in the midst of this conversation because here is a child that's playing with the world. It's a parking lot and it's a car and it's a mundane task of leaving a building and walking to a car and opening it up and getting in and going to the next place and that's exactly how his parents were going through that process. But the child was adding something to it. They turned it into a moment of play. They turned a parking lot and a car into a moment of exaltation into a moment of the world is amazing and beautiful and I'm happy to be in it and I'm going to play with it. And there's something that happens in the lives of human beings. There's a transition. I don't know if it's because of puberty or if it's because of social indoctrination in our educational system and this reality of you're going to have to get a job and, and the schooling that takes place. But there's a clear transition and you see adults as broken simulators and you see children as very lively and playful simulators. They're both simulating their world. They're simulating their environment. But kids are generally having fun with it and they approach it as a thing to play with. And adults see it as a simulation about scarcity and is about survival and is about dominance hierarchies. And they they simulate a very, very different world, and they see very different opportunities in the midst of it. They would never consider that parking lot or that car as an item of play. It's a very utilitarian uh, experience inside of their simulations. So how this is relevant is that in the midst of my studying neuroscience and in the midst of my studying uh, philosophy and Buddhist psychology, I realized that this abstraction, this left-sided space of linear, logical, linguistic you know, processing uh, or generalization or symbolism is a tool. But we, because we live in this world that you talk so much about that is really so different than the world that we evolved in, in the environment that we evolved in, that this left brain uh, abstraction is no longer seen as a tool or experienced as a tool. It's experienced as self. It's experienced as this is who I am. Whereas in those indigenous environments that we spent most of our evolutionary history in, we moved very differently. We interacted very differently. There were different compounds in the air, different chemicals. Um, I've spent a great deal of research into forest bathing and what they're doing in Korea and Japan right now, which uh, I'm sure you know, goes along very well with the research that you're doing. And how different aerosols in the air, not just from flowering plants, but from plants in general, certain trees, how they regulate and transform human physiology. And so we have this sedentary, synthetic, existence that is largely abstract and we exist mostly inside of our default mode network of operation in the brain and mostly on the left and that's not what our bodies and brains are meant to do so we no longer see that abstraction as a tool we see it as self so what I have learned to do, and I've gotten a lot of this from Buddhist philosophy and psychology, is that the self is a tool. It's not bad. It's just not you. And your abstractions and your simulations are not bad. They're just not you. And once I really began to embody this and take it on, I start to see any 
aspiration or any fear or any regret or any desire simply as a suggestion, as a tool. It's like the, my brain is handing me a tool and saying, I think this tool is appropriate for this particular situation. And then I can look at the tool and I can take another part of my brain and I can examine the actual world that I'm in, not the simulated world. Well, every world that we experience is simulated, but the, the more objective simulated world. And I can say, hmm, I'm not sure if that tool is actually appropriate. I think there might be a better approach, uh, a more uh, empowering approach than the one that you're suggesting as the default based on my genetic wiring and my upbringing and my early life experience or traumas. Uh, so I'm going to choose not to use that tool right now, but thank you very much for suggesting it. So this is where self-consciousness comes in, especially in relationship, which is mostly what the human brain was built for, is relating to others. And whenever one becomes self-conscious, it is the brain suggesting that you employ the self-tool. It's like, I think the self-tool is really important right now. Maybe you should try that one. And we become conscious of self and conscious of rank and conscious of what everything means in relation to me. But it's a tool. And it's not necessary in every moment, but yet it has become the default state of operation for human existence. So for me, yeah, I have a lot of challenges, but they're not actually real challenges. They're challenges in that, that self-conscious state of mm, my identity is being challenged, but it's just a tool. So who cares if a tool is being challenged? Who cares if the screwdriver is not the right tool for the job? I'll just get a different tool. I don't need to write a, a novel about how the screwdriver was you know, unjustly treated. So... That's, that's my thinking on that. Sorry for the long monologue.